Hello and welcome. We are going to look at circles in overview with tons of example problems. I think about 30. Uh, these will be the topics that are covered in this order and sometimes some will be used in some future things, whatever. Like you'll see tangent lines all over the place for all these different sections. Um, with each section you're going to be given a header with some notes involved including perhaps formulas or ideas and the problems that follow will probably be utilizing them. So let's get to work. First of all, definitions. I apologize, this is before all the other notes. Use the figure to choose the correct term to complete each sentence. Okay, CB, segment CB right here. Is it a secant of or a tangent to circle X? Now it's defined as circle X because X is the center point here. So still to circle X, it's hitting at one point, that would be what a tangent is. When it's tangent two, it's only hitting at one point and it looks kind of like that. Furthermore, the radius is intersecting it at 90 degrees. That's something else you'll be learning in just a bit, or revisiting. Um, EF, however, is a secant line. The secant line hits twice. DF is a chord or locus of circle X. Now, we haven't been referring to locus at all, so you can probably already assume that's not it. Um, DF is a chord. It's a segment whose endpoints are on the circle. It's going to be a chord. Locus describes how something relates to something else. I can't even explain it. Triangle DEF is inscribed in or circumscribed about circle X. If um, triangle DEF was circumscribed about, it would be on the outside touching the points like this, okay, hitting on the outside like so. Or a circle would be inscribed inside there. The triangle's inscribed in the circle. Um, its endpoints or its vertices hit the circle. So DEF is inscribed in. And finally, angle DEF right here. Well, that looks a lot like an inscribed angle of circle X right there. This inscribed angle, and we'll be talking about them more and more. Funky looking. There's the angle. Here would be the intercepted arc for DEF. It'd be DF right there. But the inscribed angle, it is an angle, so you couldn't call it an arc anyway. Kind of a funny question. They could have called it a central angle. Uh, central angles, just so you're aware, DXF would be a central angle like that. Okay. Now come some of the notes. Okay, a tangent to a circle is a line, ray, or segment in the plane of a circle that intersects a circle in exactly one point, the point of tangency. Okay, so uh, also two segments tangent to a circle from a point outside the circle are congruent. What that means is let's say I have a point right here, let's call it P, and I create a tangent line right there. Uh, let's, let me redo that. Let me make it a little thinner and a different color. If I create a tangent, let's say segment right there where it's intersecting at the tangent point of tangency and then another tangent here. Notice from any point outside the circle you can always create two points of tangency right there and two segments that go to there. These two segments are congruent. This one is congruent to this one right there. Always true for all points of tangency for the same point. If a line is tangent to a circle, then the line is perpendicular to the radius drawn to the point of tangency. So I mentioned this before. Here's a radius r. If it intersects at a tangent line, it's intersecting perpendicularly. Same with this one right here. If I drew another radius right here, perpendicular. This one right here, perpendicular. So that's always going to be true for all these radii, for any tangent lines. The converse is always true, meaning if you have a perpendicular line with your radius, that line is tangent to the circle. Okay, a triangle inscribed in a circle, if all of the, uh, a triangle is inscribed in a circle if all the vertices lie in the circle. So we just mentioned this one here. This one's inscribed. We haven't made much mention of that. When a triangle is circumscribed about a circle, each side is tangent to the circle. So the other one I drew before was like that, right? These ones I guess I didn't make mention, but they would have been tangent to it. It's the only way to make that happen. That's circumscribed about. All right, so these polygons circumscribe the circle. We have to find the perimeter of the polygon. So if they circumscribe it, then these points are tangent to it. We must find the perimeter. So right here, we're looking at points of tangency, like this guy right here. I'll call this A, B, C, D. Okay. <coughs> um, <clears throat> point A goes to a point of tangency here and here. That makes these two congruent, which means if this is 6, this is also 6. B has these two tangent segments that are congruent, so these are both 7. C has these two tangent, so these are both 8. And D has these two tangent, 
So these are both 7.5. Pretty simple uh, with that regard. You add them all up now. 6 plus 6, 12. 7 plus 7, 14. 8 plus 8, 16. 7 half, 7 half, 15. So we have 12 plus 14 plus 16 plus 15. That equals 47 inches. That is units. Let's use them. Okay, find the perimeter of these ones. Um, <laughs> what we're looking at here is 6. I assume this part's only 7 right here is what they're talking about. So this guy right here is also 6. This whole guy is 15. It doesn't show what this one is here. But what you do know is that if this is 7, this also has to be 7, which means this is 8, which means this is 8. The reason why this is 8, 7 plus 8 is 15. Same with this one here. If this is 7, then this is also 7. Seven minus, or 15 minus 7, once again, is 8. So this is also 8 right here. So these ones are 8 that are missing there. Now we have them all written out. 13, 13 is 26, 15 is 41, 16 is 57, 15 is 72. And is that where we stopped? I think so. So that's going to be 72 millimeters right there. Okay. Last one kind of has the same thing going for it. Um, actually, probably even less here. It looks like you have to work around this a little bit. This is going to be 1.2 centimeters. This is 1.9. If this is 1.9, so is this right here. So these are both 1.9, which makes the other part of this 2.9, what? 1? 1. 1.0? Which means this is 1 which means 1.8 minus 1 is 0.8. Hopefully you're following along with what I'm saying. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of saying these two parts are congruent to each other, so both of these will be 0.8, stuff like that. Just kind of working all around it. Okay, none of these are said to be congruent to each other except for the points, except for the tangent ones from the same point. So adding this up, I'm going to write these out. 1.2 plus 1.2 plus 1.9 plus, I'm going to write this as 2.9 plus 1.8 plus 0 0.8. <coughs> okay. 2.4, 4.3, 7.2, 9.0, 9.8, centimeters. I might have miscalculated, but the um, getting that stuff is, <clears throat> I guess, still the more important gist. I'm sure you know how to add on your own from there. Just leave the units. All good. Okay, segment with segments with endpoints on a circle are called chords. So we mentioned that before. So like this is a chord. Boom. boom etc. All those are chords. This is a chord too. The endpoints are on the circle. This is even a chord as well. It just wasn't constructed. So construct it yourself, I guess. <clears throat> Within a circle or congruent circles, congruent central angles have congruent chords, meaning if these are congruent, then these are congruent. By, by congruent chords, what it's referring to is chords with the same endpoints as the central angle. So I should have mentioned that. This central angle has these two endpoints here. So the chord that we're referring to is the one with the same two endpoints. Same with this one here and here. Okay, Congruent chords have congruent arcs. So if these two are congruent here, the ones with the same endpoints, these two arcs are congruent to each other. Um, congruent arcs, therefore, also have congruent central angles. I think that one we also already knew. So I'm kind of good talking about that one. Um, <clears throat> chords equidistant from the center are congruent. So if this, by distance, they're talking about the altitudinal distance. So if this and this are congruent, that means these two chords here are congruent. Okay? And chords that are equidistant from the center are congruent. Uh, I'm sorry, chords, are, chords that are congruent are also equidistant from the center. So they are biconditional statements. We've mentioned, oh, it's right here. We've mentioned that before. So equidistant from the center, these are congruent. Okay, a di well, actually, I'm not sure if that was drawn for that. This one here, though, a diameter that is perpendicular to a chord bisects the chord and its arcs. So, in other words, if you draw a radius also that goes, they don't just have to be a diameter, it could be a radius. If it's perpendicular to the chord, it's bisecting it. If it bisects it, then it's also perpendicular to it, once again, biconditional. The perpendicular bisector of the chord also contains the center of the circle. So all these three things really mesh well together. It needs to go from the center through the, um, through the center and be perpendicular, then it'll be a bisector, etc. All these things all mean the same thing. It just says if you know one, then you can know the others, which is kind of nice. Okay, find the value of x to the nearest tenth. Here we go. So, what we have here is the center. This radius here is perpendicular to this chord, which means it's bisecting this chord here. These two parts are congruent. 
If they're congruent, you can divide 11 by 2. This segment here will be 5 and a half. The diameter is 14. The diameter gets cut in half. That's 7. You should already know about that with radii. So we can solve for x here using Pythagorean theorem of this right triangle. We have <clears throat> legs 5.5, an unknown x, and 7 hypotenuse. So x squared plus 5.5 squared equals 7 squared. Uh, I don't know what 5.5 is squared. Grabbing the calculator. I don't want to be uh, make a fool of myself and make a mistake here. It's going to be 30.25. I should always have the calculator handy anyway. Okay, uh, subtract 30.25. I might make a fool of myself doing this without a calculator. 18.75. Now I got to take the square root. Would this say around to the nearest tenth? They did. So the square root of 18.75 is, and I don't know if they had units, so I'm going to take a look at that as well. Square root, 18.75 is 4.3 about units. Uh, did it have any? It did not. It would be units. So I'm going to leave out the units. Just call it 4.3. I think we're good. Number 10. We have x, which is the entire chord length. Notice how this was really helpful when we were able to make a right triangle out of it. It would be nice if we did a right triangle here as well. So the question is, how can we do that? What will the length end up being here? Well, this length, which I didn't draw very well, this length could also be recognized as 12. Keep in mind, 12 is a radius. Okay, this guy right here is the same length as everything all around. Up until that point right there, you've now got a hypotenuse for this thing, and the length is 12. So we know that one. Now this full thing is x, so half of it is half of x. That's x divided by 2, or 0.5x, or whatever you want to put. So this right triangle has legs 7, x over 2, and 12. If we use Pythagorean theorem, surely we can find out what x is by doubling that amount once we do. So we're going to square x over 2. Now remember, that goes in a quantity. It's the entire thing. Plus 7 squared equals 12 squared. x over 2 quantity squared is x squared over 2 squared. So that's x squared over 4. All right. So x squared over 4 equals, what, subtract that, 95, I think? Multiply both sides by 4. You get 380, is my belief. And x is about, well, it's exactly the square root of 380. But it's about, hang on, handy data calculator time, 19.49 is so about 19.5 units. Like that. I'm sorry. That, uh, yes, that, that was x, not x over 2. So I used x over 2 as a representation. This is not 19.5, keep in mind, is not the length of this right here. This length, I didn't even find. That would have been found right here if I took the square root of both sides. That would have gotten me x over 2 equals whatever the square root of 95 is. It's a little less than 10. It's going to be about 9.8. So obviously, 9.8 doubled, I guess, should become something really close to that or something like that. Um, see if I did that right. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, that works. Um, cool, about 9.8. Because that should have made sense, right? 19.5 is larger than 12, so obviously it won't be that. It'll be the entire chord. I did solve for x, mind you. Okay, <clears throat> they didn't really make much mention of the arc portion here, so let me make mention of it as I do this. First of all, let's reconstruct the right triangle just like we did last time. Make this length, whoa. Make this length here nine units, OK? Um, and they're mentioning this 45 here. Um, I did not mention, we mentioned that congruent central angles have congruent arcs. We didn't mention that the arc has the exact same measure as its central angle. So this 45 right here, this 45 degrees is also right here. This value is 45. If this is 45, this is 45, because we're looking at a 45, 45, 90 triangle. This is an isosceles right triangle. X appears to represent, if I'm not mistaken, just this length right here, which would be congruent to this one because this radius is, bi is perpendicular to the chord. Therefore, it's bisecting the chord. So this is also X. That means we're looking at a right triangle that looks like this, where you have right angle, 9, X, 
And don't kid yourself into thinking the other one's not x as well. This is an isosceles right triangle. This is also x right here. Now you could solve this using Pythagorean theorem. x squared plus x squared equals 9 squared. Now that I've told you that, go ahead and have fun with it. What I'm going to do instead is solve this using, and I've used a lot of blue. Let me use a different color now. What I'm going to instead do is solve this using my special proportions of my special right triangles. I know that in a 45-45-90 triangle, the ratio relationship is 1 to 1 to root 2, meaning these values are root 2 times larger. Uh, meaning 9 is root 2 times larger than these values here if I multiply these by root 2, which also means to find this x value one way or the other, I must divide by root 2. So I'm going to find x by dividing 9 by root 2. They do ask you to round to the nearest tenth. Now let's say they didn't, and they ask you to write in simplest radical form. I'm going to go ahead and do that. You have to multiply top and bottom by root 2 over 2 to rationalize the denominator. We do not want a uh, an irrational number or a radical in the denominator. Root 2 times root 2 is 2, and this becomes 9 root 2. I know this looks more complicated. You can even write it as 4.5 root 2 if it helps. But this also probably looks more complicated than this. But try all three in your calculator. They all represent the same thing. Now they did ask me to round to the nearest tenth, so I will follow that instruction. I'll type 9 over root 2, which you can't see it as I'm typing it. I'm getting 6.36, so about 6.4 units. I'm going to try 9 root 2 over 2 and see if I get the same thing. 9 root 2, which again, take my word for it, I suppose over 2, I'm also getting 6.36. So I still get the same value. Here's the best answer probably I think you can actually write. This one right here. All right. That was number, ooh, that was number 11. I almost skipped and went to the next page. Well, allow me to clear some of this stuff out so I can do number 12, OK? Number 12, <laughs> probably the easiest one. Um, in this case here, you have two congruent distances to the chords. That does mean the chords themselves are congruent to each other, which means these two have the same length. This is x. These are congruent. Therefore, this is also x. So this becomes x plus x, which is equal to 9. <laughs> so 2x is equal to 9. So x is equal to 9 over 2. Or they did say round to the nearest tenth, which the nearest tenth is also the exact value, 4.5. Probably didn't need to delete other stuff for that one. OK, let's start talking about some inscribed angles here. An angle is inscribed if the vertex is on the circle, and the sides of the angle of the chords are also on the circle. So right here, you're looking at the inscribed angle, right there, with two endpoints on the circle, and vertex also on the circle. Now keep in mind, which is probably going to say somewhere over here, I'm sure it says it in a lot of different places. This is not the only inscribed angle I can draw with the exact angle measure x. As long as I use these two endpoints and I put the vertex on the circle somewhere, all of these are also x. Every single one of these. I probably should color code them, but take a look at what angles I'm making out of these. These are all x, 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 and x. Including, which we're looking at angle y right here, Okay, including something like this. Now, what if, because I know we're going to talk about it, what if I move this thing so far over on the circle that it actually is on the other endpoint? You may do that. What's the inscribed angle going to be? This thing's going to shoot out tangentially, meaning this thing runs tangent to the circle itself. This is still x, and it still has the same intercepted arc, which is the next point I'm going to make. The intercepted arc is the arc that is made between your two endpoints of your angle whose endpoints are on the sides of the angle, and whose remaining points lie on the interior, in the interior of the angle. So this is all inside the angle right here from endpoint to endpoint right there. The intercepted arcs, the ne next part they're saying, is exactly, well, the inscribed angle is exactly half the measure of the intercepted arc. So see how this is x? OK, this is twice as much. Always, always, always. Including the inscribed angle I made over here bleh, with the tangent one. This is also x. So its intercepted arc is also 2x. It is still inside the angle. And it is still from endpoint to endpoint as follows. OK? Um, well, OK, so I mentioned this. Two inscribed angles that intercept the same arc are congruent, meaning, like I said, any of these two, this is also x. An angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. So let's say I drew a diameter that went across here. OK? And I don't really know why they need to make mention of this. I think. You just need to know when a semicircle is what it is. What if I make an inscribed angle right here? Boom, 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 boom. 
guess what? This is 90 degrees. Why? Its intercepted arc right here is 180 degrees, so the inscribed angle is exactly half that, so that's 90. Again, they probably don't need to mention it, but I think the point is, is that they're not going to be saying that this is 180 degrees for you. You have to recognize that with the diameter, they'll be doing that. Okay? Um, the opposite angles of a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle are supplementary. So, hmm, I wonder why they needed to put that here. They probably could have put that, oh, inscribed. I see what they're saying. You know what? I didn't even, I've never made mention of that before. I didn't even think much of that. So if I make a quadrilateral here, 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 and here, apparently this is supplementary with that. Didn't even think much of that, but now I understand why. Semicircle, uh, actually take that back, it's not a semicircle, but the, um, the uh, intercepted arc right here, it's half of that. These intercepted arcs together add to 360, so half of them added together add to 180. That makes sense. I will use that if I need to. So far in this chapter, I've not needed to use it or I found an alternative way to talk about it. Assume that lines, assume lines that appear to be tangent are tangent, find the value of each variable. I want to find A, B, and C. Okay, A is the intercepted arc of this inscribed angle, which is measured at 20 degrees. So A, half of A, excuse me, is 20 degrees. So multiply both sides by two, A is 40 degrees. Now what's good with these problems is sometimes you get the answer, you use the answer you get right here that's going to help you the rest of the way. For instance, B. B would be very nice for me to use if I knew something about this angle here, which I'm not so sure that I do. Just because it's the diameter doesn't mean, oh, I take that back, it does. I'm going to be making two statements about this. Um, <coughs> okay, I'm going to find B in two ways for you. I kind of talked too soon. First of all, this is a diameter, which means this semicircle is 180 degrees, which means this is a semicircle, which means 180 degrees. This is 40, so B is everything that's not 40 degrees in that. B plus 40 is 180, so B is 140. That's one way to solve B, probably the easier way. The second way, which will help me talk about C, actually, I'm sure I can find C right now. <laughs> well, I'm going to find C before I find B. C is two things. You know, I'm going backwards. Let's finish B. B, <laughs> I have a tangent line here. This is a radius. So radius intersects with the tangent line perpendicularly. This is 20 degrees, which means this part right here is 70 degrees. This 70 degrees, this measure here, is an inscribed angle whose intercepted arc is B. So if 70 is half of B, then B must be 140 degrees. That's one mention of that. Now I'm going to do C, which is half that work here. I'll write the B is 140, though. The radius here intersects with the tangent line once again at 90 degrees. And C is the inscribed angle made at that. So C is 90 degrees. Okay, one way to do it. Second way of doing it is, oh, let me box that. Second way of doing that is C's intercepted arc is the semicircle. The semicircle is 180 degrees. C is half of that. If C is half of 180. It is 90 degrees. Always good to get different ways to go about the same problem. I like to explore them for you. It's funny when I kind of look at them as I do it because I kind of talk to myself and I'm sure you get a good laugh about it. Number 14, this is an example of a triangle inscribed in a circle. And B is the rest of all of this that equals 180 degrees. The interior angles of a triangle add to 180. B plus 59 plus 72. So B plus 131 means that, oh, 49. B is 49 degrees right here. And don't kid yourself into thinking B can't help you solve for some of these other ones, especially D here. I'm going to say there are a lot of ways to solve these other problems. I'm going to try and go one at a time unless I feel like it's necessary to do more. Let's go with what we saw for just B right there. I think it's just good momentum. B, 49 is an inscribed angle whose endpoints are out there, which means D is its intercepted arc. 
B, 49, is half of D. The intercepted arc is double the amount of the inscribed angle. So D is 98 degrees. Okay. Now as I can erase some other stuff, hopefully here, and take a look at what else we got. All right, um, let's use a different color. Blue. A and C, kind of same thing. You're looking at some inscribed angles here. Okay, 59 degrees is an inscribed angle with the endpoints that go out here whose intercepted arc is A degrees. So half of A is 59, which means A is double 59, which means A is 108, 118, excuse me, degrees. That goes there. Okay, now C, looks like I can do this actually two different ways. One way is doing the good old inscribed angle thing we just did, like 72 here is an inscribed angle whose intercepted arc is C. 72 is half of C, so C is double 72, which is 144 degrees. That's one way. Second way is taking the sum of the measures of your three arcs here, because all three of them, D, A, and C, add to 360. Now, this only works because I knew what these other two were. I had learned what they were prior to. Uh, C plus, excuse me, 98 plus 118 equals 360. So C plus 216 equals 360. So C, once again, is 144. Two ways to go about that one. Pretty nice. Number 15. Let's use a different color. I haven't used red. Red just comes off too bright at times or mixes with these, but that's all right. All right, the one that, the two of them shine pretty loose and easy to me right here. 45 is an inscribed angle whose intercepted arc is B. Okay, so B is double that amount. 45 times 2 is 90. Okay, A is a central angle, and a central angle is equal to its arc with the same endpoints. So A is also going to be 90 degrees, like so. So A and B I got pretty quickly there. C is, hang on, what I wanted to say first is that there's no assumption I can play just yet, which it might be true, but we'll see. There's no assumption I can play just yet that C and D are congruent. Okay, this, this 45 could have been drawn in any other sort of way. We don't know that this is, a, that this is going straight out, right? So all I was going to say was I'm not going to get D until I get C because C, 45, and D all add up to 180. Let's get C first because we have something actually here. Actually, I take that back. You could get D if you figure out what the measure of this arc is. Two different ways to get D. I'll get them in a second. C is an inscribed angle right here. Now, keep in mind, the vertex and endpoint are both on the same point. This is a tangent line. That's okay. C's intercepted arc is right here in green, which is 140 degrees. C, as the inscribed angle, is half of 140, which is 70 degrees. Okay, two different ways to get D from there. If C is 70, 70 plus 45 plus this number gives you 180 degrees. So we'll start with that one. That's 115 minus uh, da, 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 D gives you, I think, 65 degrees. So they're not congruent. Pretty close, but not. Second way I could have gotten it was use the inscribed angle with this arc. Before I said you couldn't find this arc, I take that back. 140 plus 90 is 230. The rest here out of 360 would be 130. So if this is 130, then half of that for this inscribed angle here is 65. And I think that's it on this page. A secant is a line, ray, or segment that intersects a circle at two points. So secant line right here, for example, hits here and here. Secant line right here intersects at these two points here and here. Stuff like that. Uh, once again, secant line, secant line. There's some different intersection types we're going to be looking at here. We're going to be looking at intersecting two secant lines, or in this case, chords, when they're inside the circle. This angle right here is also congruent to this one here, both angle one, not one degree. But the measure of angle one is equal to half of the sum of this arc with this arc. Okay. The reasoning behind it, which I guess unfortunately if I move this thing it's not going to help very much, but the reasoning behind it is whatever I lose as I 
close this up. Keep in mind, this angle has not changed. It stays the same as I move it. If I move it and close up on X completely, let's say like that, okay? Notice how this intercepted arc has now grown. This is Y degrees. Guess how much this is? Yup, it's X. It's as much as I lost. So if an inscribed angle right here is half the measure of its intercepted arc, notice how the angle never changed and its intercepted arc did to this, the sum of those two. Okay, So that's kind of the reasoning behind that I like to mention. Um, that's as good as it gets, really, especially how interactive it is. Same thing kind of happens to this one, only the intersection of secant lines outside of the circle now become, if I move this one inward, I lose all of x and I lose x amounts of y. This amount gets cut off within there. So I'm going to do y minus x, in this case, half of it, to get the measure of an inscribed angle if I move this angle up there. So the measure of angle B is half of Y minus X, or the big arc minus the small arc, intercepted arcs. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples here. All right, number 16, let's find A and B. There's no assumption to see that these are, to, there's no way to assume these are 90 degrees for any reason. Looks like I have to solve A before I solve B, that's fine. So to solve A, it's gonna be half the measure of 145 degrees here plus 45 degrees here. Remember, this is also A. Both of these are vertical angles. So half of 145 plus 45. Um, oops, which is half of 190, which is 95 degrees. So it's close to 90 degrees. And they say they're not drawn to scale, but for the most part, they tend to be pretty close. This is 95, and B with it is supplementary to it. So A plus B is 180, so B is 85 degrees. That's all. I'm sure there are other ways to do it. I'm not as keen on doing them those other ways. All right, X, this angle measure right here, it's going to be half of 100 minus 26, which is half of 74 which is 37. I'm not going to spend time on problems that I don't need to, like beyond that. The work is all you have and all you need. I did the explanations up there. All right, number 18. It looks like you have a lot. So you look at it, you get confused for a second, say, all right, I just want somewhere to start. Okay. And as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking it looks like V is a proper place to start because furthermore, there's a good chance that getting V can help you get other ones like Z, right? So V is half of 72 plus 30, okay? Notice those two intercepted arcs. Which is half of 102, which I think is 51. And there's V. So as I cross out V and put in 51. All right, there's 51 degrees, so Z plus 51 is 180. <laughs> uh, subtract 51, you're going to get Z equals um, 129. Okay. Where I'm looking to go next is getting X. It looks like I cannot get Y unless I get X. I take that back. There are two ways I can get X. I was going to go a very difficult way about getting X. I'll show you what I was going to do outside of what you probably would think of doing, adding up all of these up to 360. I was going to say 129. See, this is overthinking it. I was going to say you get 129, this angle here, by taking half of this with this, which is true, right? 129 is half of this plus this. So watch how I get X in the more difficult way. I'm not like, I'm not bragging about that. What I'm saying is, you get x the way you need to. I want to show that this relationship still applies here. Check it out. 116 plus x is the measure of the arc, the intercepted arc on the other side of 129, 85 in those. So all those combined together, half of that should give you 129. So half of um, 201 plus x. Also, that way I can do a problem like this. You might think that you should distribute this one half. And by all means, you can. Problem is you, you're going to deal with fractions or integers. 
Let's multiply both sides by 2 instead. Okay? Because 2 over 2 is 1. Those go away. This just becomes 2 times 129, which is a lot easier to deal with, even though the number is bigger. It's 258. This is 201 plus x. I think you already like that. x is now 57 degrees. So did you try the other way and also get 57? I sure hope it was, because I don't want to do it again. Um, I'm going to trust it. But the other way I was going to say, you know, add up all of these, set them equal to 360. Uh, x will, I guess, be 57. Okay, y is just like x in the sense that it has that combination. It was not just like x. It's just like the last problem that I did in that this intercepted arc right here third is 30 plus 116. You have to add up two of them. Now, I didn't mention a secant line with a tangent line, and I probably should have. This isn't just true for secant lines. This is for any intersections outside the circle that end up touching the circle at any points, whether it's a secant contact or tangent contact. So if it touched right here as well, instead, tangentially, it would still have the same kind of idea, just a different looking arc. So in this case here, you have two arcs. You have the small arc of 57 degrees right here. And then up here in green, you have this large arc, intercepted arc that's between there, that's 130 plus, or that's 30 plus 116, which total apparently is 146. So when I solve for y, I'm going to be taking half of 146 minus 57. There we go. So half of that, oh, this is an odd number. Not like a different number, it's odd actually. Half of 89, half of 89 is 89 over 2. Very exactly that is 44.5 degrees. No one ever said these all to be integers. And I think I found them all. I did. All right, we're going to look at chords again, secant lines intersecting inside the circle, outside the circle. Only difference now is we're not going to look at the angle measures. We will look at the fragmented segments here when they're broken up by their point of intersection or by an intersection with the circle, such as this right there. The first one here is an intersection inside the circle. And using a proof with similar triangles, you can create a setup where A over, I think it was D, equals C over B or anything of that nature. Okay, something where. A to D is C to B. These triangles are similar in that sort of way. And you cross multiply and you get to here. The way that I prefer to look at this instead isn't just A times B equals C times D. It's just this part of the segment times this part of that same segment equals this part of this segment times this part of this segment. So part of the same segment when you multiply. And I know you kind of scratch your head and go, is that true? Like, is that always true? Uh, well, yeah, apparently it is. Um, as you get closer to something, notice that you're multiplying a big number by a small one and different things like that. Um, furthermore, as you get into two secant lines multiplied outside of here, two similar triangles also exist to the point where you can create a cross multiplication look like this. Um, when I write the notes, I prefer to write this w over here. Only reason I say it is because it'll be consistent with the notes that I've done. And it's not just w times w plus x. w represents the outside. W plus X represents the whole. So take a look at this green segment here, outside times whole. Okay, it's equal to outside times whole. Now once again, it would have just been a whole times outside on the other side if Y and W were on the other side, but I'm just used to saying that ow. It says ow. Ow equals ow. Ow, ow. I guess whoa, whoa would work. Um, now that's two secant lines, and this is the same thing with one tangent line and one secant line. There's really no difference. It still is y over here. It still is outside times whole equals outside times whole. The only thing is about t is that as it's tangent, it never goes inside the circle. So the outside is the whole. t outside times t whole is t squared. That still is outside times whole. So all these are still that product. The reason why two tangent lines isn't being written on this is because we already know about two tangent lines. Two tangent lines, <laughs> even though it doesn't look it, two tangent lines from the same point are congruent. This is congruent to that. So there's not much to say about a relationship with all that. Let's do three examples, and I think that's it for these examples afterward. 
All right, this first one is the two secant lines. We're going to multiply the, on the top one, the outside with the whole. And set it equal to the outside on the bottom with the whole. Pretty straightforward setup. Instead of distributing the 9 with the 9 and 19, let's add 9 and 19 together. Now I've got to distribute 10 with 10 and x. Okay. Um, 9 times 28. Ignore that. 9 times 28 is uh, 100, 252. Hope that's right. So subtract 100, 10x is 152, and x is 15.2. Exactly. Units, I'll ignore them. Let me make sure 9 times 28 is 252. I don't, I don't want to be wrong. OK, that's good. Uh, number 20. In this segment here, this times this equals 5 times 8 over here. Okay, with the relationship we spoke of above. 10x is 40, excuse me, 40x is 4. Some of these, I, I'm not going to spend time going through the algebra of those concepts. Those should be pretty well understood. Setting this up is the geometry understanding. Now, 13 is this length right here. This is outside times whole. 13 times 13, that's 13 squared, equals outside times whole, like that. Too bad there are no quadratic ones here. I really would have loved to have a quadratic function in this. Not like, oh, give me the challenge, but give you the challenge, right? Give you something that you're going to have to work with, possibly at some point. Uh, 105 over 8. Let's see, 80 is 10, and then 104 would be 13. So 13.18, 125. That would be exact. I think they said round to the nearest tenth, maybe. They did. So it's approximately 13.1. Even though I got an exact decimal out of it, they still want that in its place. There you go. That's all for those ones. And like I said, if there's a quadratic one, and by quadratic, what I mean is, what if this got switched. What if this was 8 and this was x? Okay, well now you're outside times whole, outside times whole. Check this out. This would be x times, well, 8 plus x. You would have gotten 8x plus x squared. See how you would have had to deal with that? So there's some quadratic ones that would be nice to come into play. In this case, you don't have them. And actually, that would not be a very pretty one. That would end up being weird integer values that I'm probably not willing to deal with there. Actually, yeah, th those would be bad. All right, um, let's get some graphing ones here. The equation x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals r squared is in standard form. This is regarding a circle. The standard equation of a circle is represented as such, where h, k, is the center, and r is the radius. x and y represents any coordinate pair that is on the circle itself. Remember, a circle is not the center, it is not its radius, it is not the area. It is this. x and y can represent any coordinate pair on here. And what this is representing in this equation is saying if you find the distance in your x's from your center to your x coordinate of your circle and the distance in your y's, difference in distance in your y's, you can find the radius, which is possibly slanted and acts as a right triangle, um, where you can use Pythagorean theorem. And that's exactly what this is. If you don't know it yet, you will see it in the problems that you do. If you, if you know the center and a point in the circle, you can write them in standard form like this. Now, the one thing that's going to trick you a little bit is the center is at h, k, not negative h, negative k. Even though we are subtracting h and k, if it says x minus 2, your h is positive 2, not negative 2. And if this said y plus 7, this would be negative 7, not positive 7, because it's y minus negative 7. And remember, this is r squared, not r over here. Let's write the standard of equation. The standard equation of a circle with the center and the radius. Now, I'm going to graph it for you so you can see what the graph looks like. It did not ask you to graph at all whatsoever. These actually can be done completely without a graph. In fact, I might skip the graphs for some of them. The center here is at 2, 5. Okay. Radius is 3 and a half. Now, the best way that I'm able to do a radius for you is go 3 and a half north, south, east, and west. That one's east, north. West, as Patrick would say, west and south. If you have a compass or my circle tool like I'm going to use, it's going to be a lot easier for, you, easier for you. Otherwise, do the best you can 
and try and edge out what that circle would look like. So that's what the circle looks like. I'm just letting you know that right now. I don't know why I did it. I don't think I'll do it with these ones because this is information and nothing else. But what's happening here is you choose any point on the circle x, y, such as this one right here. Okay. The distance between x, y, and the center h, k, remember this is h, k, the distance is r right here. And that's described by trying to find out the distance between your x and your h right here, that's x minus h, and the distance between your y and k right here, that's y minus k. So you use Pythagorean theorem by squaring x minus h, adding y minus k quantity squared, and you get r squared. That's why it's Pythagorean theorem, and that's why we're going to be writing it in this way. The difference is, we know what the center is, we know what the radius is, we will write the equation based on that. x can be any sort of x's on the circle, anywhere, including all the way down to negative one and a half, and up to positive, what, five and a half? Plus y minus, now remember these are, we're subtracting these values here, equals r squared. Now r was 3.5, I'm going to square that. To write it perfectly, to simplify everything as much as possible, I must square that 3.5 actually. I believe I squared 3.5, right? it was 12.25, does that sound right? I feel like I did this recently. I did, 12.25. You, you don't just know that off the top of your head unless you've kind of done it a couple times. So I feel like I have. That's the equation. That's all I'm going to do. All of these are kind of like that, to be honest. All the, I don't think I need the graphs for them. I think, really, I just wanted to show you what an instance of that would look like. But I do want to show you more with these graphs and say, OK, well, this is kind of how they came to be, or this is how we can use them. So number 31 here centers at negative 3, 1 r is the square root of 5. Now this is where things get a little tricky. And I'm actually going to zoom in somehow. Really close. Well, that's as close as I can get. Okay, square root of 5, you and I both don't really know what that number is. I know sort of what it is. But how else can you get the square root of 5? Think Pythagorean theorem. How can you get the square root of 5? Well, you can do 2 plus 3. If, if it's all about a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You can do um, 2 plus 3, that equals 5, 1 plus 4. <laughs> 2 plus 3 equals 5, which is not ideal. I'll tell you why in a second. 1 plus 4 equals 5, which actually will be ideal. Or 0 plus 5 equals 5, or any combination of those. The reason is because remember, a squared is 2. So what's a? The square root of 2. I don't know how to go the square root of 2 over, or the square root of 3 over. This one would have been nice, but we still don't know the square root of 5, so that one doesn't help either. This one works, though. What's the square root of 1? 1. What's the square root of 4? 2. So what does that allow me to do? If, that, if, if I do the square root of 1, I can go 1 unit over, and the square root of 4 units up, which is 2. 1 unit over, 2 units up. This is actually a point. This one right here is actually a point on my circle. So is this one here. 1 unit over, 2 units up. One unit up, two units over. One unit down, two units over. Hopefully you kind of get what I'm saying here. Everything here is based on Pythagorean theorem. These are part of a circle. The, these are my circle. This is my circle, guys. All of these here, plus the square root of five north, south, east, and west. I don't exactly know what they are. But using compass, excuse me, uh, compass or my circle tool, I can get as close as possible. Check this out. If I go to one of them, I go to all of them. That's not bad. Okay. That's what the circle looks like. And the only reason I'm saying that again is because I'm stressing this Pythagorean theorem concept. Right. All of this is really Pythagorean theorem. It's not just a formula. 1 squared plus 2 squared equals r squared. And r is, well, r is not 5. r is the square root of 5. But r squared is 5. Okay. That's a good example of it. But what's the equation? Different story. All right, what do we got here? x minus negative 3 quantity squared plus y minus, I think it was 1 quantity squared, equals root 5 squared. So you don't want to leave it like this, once again, just like this one. You know, clean it all up. x minus negative 3, that's x plus 3. Your center, though, keep in mind, is at negative 3, comma 1. Root 5 squared is 5. That's it. So, I mean, the equation of the circle, you know, I almost don't prefer problems to be written this way because it's almost asking you to 
come up with things that eh, they're not as important. I'd say from the equation, it's a lot more important to pull out stuff. And even that graphing thing, I, that, not that it's impossible to graph at all. You might not know the square root of 5, but you know something that you can use to get to there. And this one's actually easier in the sense, at least for the graphing portion, because your radius, well, I actually can't graph this. Um, looking at it here, at 9, negative 4, shoot, my circle's going to go literally off the, off the edge. Um, let me zoom out again. This is a little too far over. That's yeah, still far over. Um, but this circle here, you know, it's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, radius of 4. You can see how it goes off. But eh, the graph's about like that. Irrelevant. Let's go straight to the equation. x minus 9 squared plus y minus 4 squared equals 4 squared. x minus 9 squared plus, I think I said y minus 4. I meant y minus negative 4. Let's save time. y minus negative 4 is y plus 4. 4 squared is 16. There you go. No graphs needed. Again, I, I wanted to make reference to this, though, because I am about to now, I think, write equations as the next set of problems based on some information or whatever. So this time, well, no, I take that back. There's still more of these problems. OK. Uh, no, well, OK, these are a little different. So this time, you don't have the radius. So this time, it's going to be useful to use the graph. So uh, given the same information up here, we're going to find the center and the radius. This time we have to write the equation not knowing that stuff. So radius is missing. Now there are two ways to find it. Okay, One way, my preferred way for you, at least in a very visual sense here, is use Pythagorean theorem. 4, 9 is up here. This is a point on the graph. So you know what the circle looks like, even though you wouldn't ideally have this information. The circle looks like this. All right? so that's how big it is. We're trying to find the distance between here. That's the radius. Let's pretend like that circle's not existing for us because, you know, I want to deprive you of some of the information because I don't think you would be able to pick that one out of there. But so you're well aware of what it is that's going on, we got to find this distance here. I'm going to call it r, obviously, for radius. Um, we have to find the distance between the y's, or y and k, 9 minus 1, that's 8. And then the distance between 4 and 0, that's 4. So it's Pythagorean theorem from here. If you didn't, in actual, well, here, I'm going to write that below. 4 squared plus 8 squared equals r squared. Now, if you didn't know that information, you didn't have that, you're going to have to use your standard equation of the circle, x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals r squared. Now, you have an x, y value. That's 4, 9. That's this right here. And h and k are 0 and 1. So you can take 4 subtract 0 and square it, and then add 9 minus 1 and square it, and that'll equal r squared. Take a look. You're here. Now, you might have taken a look at that and said, well, that was a lot quicker. And, you know, maybe it was. And you're like, I can do that. That's good. But don't lose sight of what it is you have. Furthermore, don't miscalculate anything. Um, and even furthermore, you know, just I totally make sense of it. If you have a, cir if you have a center and a point on the circle, any point on the circle would do, but you have the given point here. You need to find the radius. Still not done, actually, at this point. r squared is 80. Now, we can find r. You don't have to. You have to write the equation of the circle. Either way, I'm going to do it. You know me. That's the square root of 16 times the square root of 5, which is 4 root 5 written as simply as possible. Now this has nothing to do with what I need here. I need r squared because I'm going to write the equation of the circle and I use r squared for that. But as far as where 4 root 5 belongs, that is this length right here. Four, uh, I'm trying to change this into, I guess, a 5, 4 root 5. There you go. There's your radius. So the final equation with all that, x, I can't remember the center. OK, well, here's another part of this thing. Here's the center, x minus 0 squared plus y minus 1 quantity squared equals r squared, which is 80. Is this as best as I can write it? No, because x minus 0 is just x. So I can take this completely out of parentheses and just write it like that. Would they accept an answer such as that top one? I hope so. The problem with it is 
if it's multiple choice, there's a good chance you're not seeing this, you're seeing this. Also, if you're given an equation to graph something from, and you know, you want to know what this means. Okay, so uh, hopefully you got the gist of what that means now. All right, two more. I know that one seemed like a lot. So in these last two, I'm going to do one one way and one the other way. This one, let's go ahead and uh, do it with the graph. The other one I'll do just with the equation to satisfy both things and save some time. Here's your center. Here's a point on the circle. I have to find the distance from one to the other. Okay. So the distance, using a right triangle here, let's find the change in y and the change in x. Go down 7, go over 6. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's negative or positive, and I think that's something else that you guys might be concerned about. What if one of these turns negative? Well, you're going to square the number anyway. I'm talking about distance. I'm talking about absolute value. So 7 squared plus 6 squared equals r squared. And actually on this one, I'm not even going to find the radius. I'm just going to find r squared. Go exactly through the problem as needed. r squared is 85. So using my center that I had, negative 2 comma 3 as h and k, x minus negative 2 will be x plus 2 squared plus, and I think it was 3, y minus 3 squared, that equals 85. There's your equation. If we want to answer the question as asked, we can do that as well. I'm totally fine playing their game. Okay, this one here, just the same, only it's good to mark up what h, k, and x and y are. And you're going to see an example here where you get negative values within and you square it. This is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. And some people kind of ask, you know, the whole thing about the negative and whatever else. The distance between two values is the difference between them. Although I said I wouldn't be using these points, I want you to take a look at the difference between the points 10 and negative 8. Is there a distance apart 2? Uh, no, it's 10 plus 8. So 10 minus negative 8 gives you that distance of 18. That's how we're getting this number here. Now our number ends up being negative 18. But when you square it, as you know, you should still be getting the positive result of it. Negative 18 quantity squared, I want to say it's 324. 18 squared, I want to say. Um, yes. And r squared equals 468. Hey, I don't need to solve for r. It's a little more than, I think, 22. Um, so what's my center? 10, 7. x minus 10 plus y minus 7. Some people ask, why I go back to x and y after I have an x and y? Because x and y is any coordinate pair on the graph that you'd like to use on the circle. It's not just one of them, any of these x's. So if you want to check this stuff out a little bit more and confirm that this works, okay, pick any other point on the graph that would work. Now, which ones would? Well, gee, this has a radius of 18. Oh, I'm sorry, the radius isn't 18. The radius is the square root of 468. Uh, like this one, 4 root 5, well, square root of 80, 14, 64. Let's try another one. How about this one? I'm going to go 8 over this way and 4 down. Okay. Here's another point on the graph, right, on the circle. If you don't believe me, you believe me now, close enough. This point right here is negative 8, negative 3. I'm going to substitute negative 8 for x, negative 3 for y, two completely different points from 4 and 9. And you're going to see how the left side equals the right side in this equation because this equation is explaining the fact that any x, y point that's on the circle will match the left side as it does the right side. Negative 8 squared, what was it? Negative 8, negative 3, plus negative 3 minus 1, quantity squared equals 80. 64 plus 16 equals 80. Yep. Bone chilling, right? Ain't that awesome? So that checks out any point on the graph. Doesn't have to be integers, but then again, I also don't truly know what any of those other points are. Like if I get this graph here and I'm like, oh, look, I want to use this point right here. Well, you can use it. You just have to know exactly what it is for it to work. Integers are always your best things you can use. 
last three problems. And these ones, we're going to describe the circle with the given equation. I probably should have pasted some graphs into there. Sorry that I did not. Let me do that right now. It's going to be really quick. All right. So let's paste three graphs in here. One, two, three. Now, they did not ask us to graph it, but I will graph it on your behalf. It sounded weird. I'm rhyming up here. All right. Um, as, as far as description, description means give me the center, give me the radius. Okay. So the reason I want to talk about this whole thing is because normally you don't graph straight from an equation. Ideally so, what you would do is you would find out where the center is, and what the radius is, and then you would graph from there. So the center, here, here's an example of that x squared thing, right? x minus 0. This is 0. Y minus 8, the k value is 8, not negative 8, positive 8. Square root of 49 is 7. Here's a description. You're good enough there. What does the graph look like? Like this and like that. Saving some time for you. This one, number 29, your center is at 5, negative 9, minus negative 9, right? Your radius is the square root of 40. But let's write that in simpler terms. How about 2 root 10? Now, how do I do this in such a way that I can actually plot this graph as in terms of square root of 40 or 2 root 10? Let's we'll start from 5, negative 9, down here. Okay. The best way I would do it is pick a point, like I said, in a right triangle. What is 40 as a result of two perfect squares? I've already thought of 4 plus 36. And I don't know if they thought of that when they made this one. But if I went, this is 2 squared and 6 squared. So if I went 2 over and 6 up or something like that, check this out. This is a point on the graph. 2 over and 6 up, this is a point on the graph. I don't think you're being asked to graph these, so to speak. Um, still good to know. This is a point on the graph. If I go to any one of these with the circle tool, you'll see once again that I'm going to hit all of them. Okay, it's pretty cool magic. Now you're not being asked to graph. Again, I'm giving you more than you need, but this is the information you have to give. Last one here, center, negative one, comma zero, y minus zero, radius square root of nine is three. I'll do this graph the old fashioned way. Negative one, zero, let's plot some points, three up, three right, three down, three left. Draw the best circle that you can with that. This ain't too bad. That's not bad. Compared to that, not bad at all. That's pretty bad. Okay, that's it. Beep, 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 beep. That's all, folks. Fiend!